if um, hopefully you have the teaching guides available, even if you aren't filling them in in the moment, because there is a prayer that we're going to pray together at the end of the session. So if you either have that or look on with somebody nearby you, okay? So a heads up on that so we're not rushing, rushing around later to do that. Okay, so here we are, lesson eight. It went by fast somehow. <laughs> so we are taking a look at the second part now the second lesson about Peter's apostolic adventures. Last week, we examined the experiences of Peter and others after they had the outpouring of the Holy Spirit into their hearts at Pentecost, as well as taking a look at some of the, the things about the early growth and persecution of that, that church in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. This week, we're going to examine the remainder of Peter's ministry here on earth as he carried out his apostolic role to fulfill the commission that Jesus had given to him, right? To feed my sheep. And therefore, as we think about feeding sheep, we're going to glean some additional lessons building on last week with regard to our role too in being spiritual messengers for the purpose of bringing more souls into the kingdom of God and building up the body of Christ by way of application. We'll be looking at that further today. We pick up the story, though, of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the early church in Acts chapter 9 with the story of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, which I think most people remember. He was a major persecutor of that early church, right? And after his conversion, he was ministering in Damascus for about three years. And then I think he had a longing to be back with the other apostles. And so he came to Jerusalem. And as you know from your homework, that wasn't, you know, wasn't welcomed with open arms by everybody. They were rather suspicious, weren't they? Was he really a true disciple after the persecution that they had seen? And so um, Barnabas seems to be the one that always kind of steps in and helps resolve some of those issues. So he spent some time with him and helped the others to feel comfortable that indeed he was a, a, a true disciple of Jesus Christ. So he stayed there and he pre preached boldly in the name of Jesus Christ for a period of time until some Grecian Jews tried to kill him. And at that point, the brothers in Jerusalem helped to get him to safety in Caesarea so he could then sailed off to Tarsus. That was his birthplace, and that's where he went to minister. Tarsus is in what is southern Turkey today. And there he ministered to the Jews. Okay. Then for a period of time in Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, there was a bit of a time of peace and a lot of growth of that early church. And at that time, Peter was preaching also to Jews and in cities such as Joppa and Lydda, which is in the area of currently Israel. So we see how they're kind of spread out now in terms of those disciples sharing the message. But it's just to Jews. It's just to Jews to this point, which brings us to an important point to discuss this morning. And that's how do we get beyond that? So I came across a very interesting phrase that said how, Christ, how Christianity becomes an unhindered gospel. I had not heard that, that phraseology before, but I think it describes well what we're facing as we, we look at this period of time for, um, for Peter. The persons who had initially been scattered by the persecution after Stephen's stoning they had traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, again, telling the message of Jesus only to the Jews. What had kind of happened, I think a good way to describe it was that Christianity had almost become kind of a sect, a special sect within that, that uh, the Judea, in Judaism, where they were definitely believed that Jesus was the Messiah who had come. Right, um, but it, it stayed just just sharing that message with the Jews. So we want to take a look now. How does this happen that we get beyond that? How does God begin to work to change their mindset? 
right? So that they would take the message to others so that it would no longer be hindered by prejudice, bias, and cultural short-sightedness. We know God intended it from the beginning, right? To not just be something exclusive to the Jews, but that it was for all people, right? The message was for everyone. Romans 10, 12 says that well. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly, richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the important message. So Christianity should be unhindered. It shouldn't matter what nation or race or gender or whatever, right? It is for all people. So let's take a look at how God began to change that mindset. And that begins with the visions of Cornelius and Peter that you looked at in your homework. The vision of Cornelius was of an angel telling him to send men to, to Joppa and bring back to Caesarea where he lived, the man named Peter, right? And now Cornelius was a Roman centurion, and he's described as one that is devout and God-fearing, a man who gave generously and prayed to God regularly. You may recall from the first or second lesson, we talked about the difference between um, someone who was a Gentile that becomes a Jewish proselyte, right? They take on everything with regard to the Jewish religion. A God-fearing person, you may recall, was one who believed in one God, and they respected the moral and ethical um, laws of the Jews, but they were not circumcised and, a few, and baptized to become a proselyte. So here we have this Roman centurion. He's a Gentile and a devout, God-fearing man. In Acts 11.14, it gave us a little bit more information um, about what was revealed to Cornelius in, his, in the vision. And that was that he was told that Peter would bring a message through which Cornelius and his whole household would be saved. So now we go to Peter's vision, which is kind of a different one, isn't it? <laughs> you see this big, what looked like a sheet being lowered down by the four corners from heaven. And on that sheet are four-footed animals and reptiles and birds. And then a voice says to Peter, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Now think about Peter. Peter, yes, he's a believer now, but he's grown up right in that Jewish faith and, and never would he have eaten those kinds of things, right? So his, his response is not surprising when he says, surely not, Lord, I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. And then a voice came back, right? The voice spoke again and said, not once, but three times, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. While Peter's still kind of pondering what's going on with this vision, three men arrive. They're the ones that had been sent to take him back to Caesarea, to Cornelius's house. But I had to stop and pause a little bit. And I was thinking about um, the, those words, clean and impure and such. And it made me go back and take a look and reread the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16. It's in uh, chapter 16, verses 29 to 33, if you want to take a look at it later. But I, I, I'm just kind of smiling to myself and reading that again about how you see such foreshadowing of Jesus, you know, in that and how the clean and sins and stuff comes out. So in that, it says, you will be clean from all your sins. The high priest makes atonement once a year for all the sins of the Israelites, and it will be a lasting ordinance. Now, that priest did it once a year, right, at that point in time and had the forgiveness for all of them. And of course, Jesus did but cross one time only. But it's interesting foreshadowing, isn't it? And that whole discussion about being clean relates back to what um, Peter saw in his vision. Now, upon Peter's arrival at uh, the home of Cornelius, there's a very large gathering of people. And it's important for us to appreciate that it was not only a, a lot of Gentiles, right? 
at Cornelius's home. Um, but also there was a band of believing Jews that had accompanied Peter um, to Caesarea. So we have a large group, mixed group here, of the, of the, the believers and these Gentiles that are eager to hear things. I thought it was also interesting that it mentions a couple times that Peter still doesn't quite understand why he's there. <laughs> I kind of got a, I kind of got a kick out of that. And he even turned to Cornelius at one point and says, "May I ask why you sent for me?" <laughs> and then Cornelius responds, ex really expectant with this expectancy. Uh, now we're all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord's given you to tell us. So I thought, interesting start to this event between these two key players, right? We have Peter who doesn't know why he's here. <laughs> and we have Cornelius not knowing what to expect to hear. <laughs> that's the stage that's been set. <laughs> so you can't help but think that how bold, right? how bold Peter really was when he stood up and spoke to them, this mixed group, and I'm not even sure really why I'm here. But he gets up and he does his, his preaching, which is very, very impressive. In your homework, I asked you to take a look at um, what were some of the key points that you pulled from that message that he gave. There's a lot of things there. I happen to come up with five key ones, um, but it would not be exhaustive. He talked, uh, what the first two were really, that got me, was God doesn't show favoritism. Whoa, Peter's getting it quick, right? He just has that, that vision, right? And he's made this trip. And for him to say that, that's, he's, he's really, the Holy Spirit's really working on him to open up his mindset. God doesn't show favoritism. And related to that, Jesus Christ is Lord of all, right? He said that in his message. He also indicated that God had anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and that Peter was a witness to all that Jesus had done that way. Also said Jesus was killed on the cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and he was seen by many witnesses when he was resurrected. And lastly, that all the prophets testify about him. Right? There, was, there was word that, that this would happen. And everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So you can see he's kind of catching on pretty good to making this an unhindered gospel. So the result of Peter's message that day says the Holy Spirit right, was poured out on everyone that day who heard the message even on the Gentiles, quote, unquote, <laughs> even on the Gentiles. And there again was the demonstration of that outpouring of the Holy Spirit by people speaking in tongues and praising God. So as a result of that outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Peter then says, well, can we keep any of these people from being water baptized now? They've already received the Holy Spirit. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, based on um, this encounter between Peter and Cornelius and this large group, I pondered and looked at it a little deeper, and I came up with four additional observations that I pulled from this account. The first one was that God brings just the right people together at just the right time. <laughs> Didn't he? That's exactly what he did and, and how quickly that all worked out, right? The right people, Cornelius, Peter, Gentiles, Jews, all together at just the right time and the outpouring of that Holy Spirit. Pretty amazing event. And it's kind of a silly example, but what popped into my mind is just the right people at the right time is what I thought about was my father-in-law in the early 60s in North Dakota, all of a sudden deciding we're moving to California. And Wayne, my husband-to-be, right, was, was a young boy at the time. And so Wayne ends up in California, in Napa. We meet in high school, and God called him to share the gospel message with my entire family. 
And I get chills when I think about that. Just the right people, just the right time, right? A little example, but it popped into my mind and I was thinking about this. The second observation that I had was I was impressed by the obedience and the trust that was exhibited by Peter and Cornelius. You think about it, they both really had to kind of step out of their comfort zones, <laughs> didn't they? This is, this, is, this is pretty major. And I couldn't help but think, hmm, what nudging of the Holy Spirit might I need to be paying attention to that's going to test me in that way? To, to get out of my comfort zone, step out one foot at a time, right? Because if he's calling, he's going to equip me and help it work out. But we have to listen to those nudges, right? And be willing to have enough trust, faith to make that step out of our comfort zone. Third, I was impressed by the hunger of the Gentile peeps over there that had gathered to hear, wanted to hear everything that the Lord had told Peter to come and share with them. And I thought, boy, aren't we so fortunate today that that word of God is so readily available to us in so many ways, right? And I thought, boy, let us not ever take that for granted, <laughs> right? Which worries me a little bit when some of the things that we see happening in, in the world and some of the pushback against faith values. Don't Let's not take it for granted. And may we never lose the hunger, the hunger for the word. The fourth point was that I was impressed by this transformation of the minds and hearts. We talked about already those that were involved, but additionally, in some of the scriptures that we looked at, we also find that we have these astonished people, astonished circumcised believers who came with Peter and critical circumcised believers back in Judea who hear all about this, who suddenly are accepting of these Gentiles. They see this astonishment and disbelief and this criticism turned to acceptance and their hearts opened to that realization that God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. I thought about that. And I thought, what do we need to do in our faith walk to be considered unhindered, right? There, I think God really wants us to question what builds up walls sometimes between us and others that, that can be cause for them not hearing the message. And he, he looks to us, let's create some doors and windows <laughs> in that wall to break that down to make sure that that message goes out. I came across a couple of quotes that I wanted to share with you that were related to this. One was um, Eric Fromm, and I had to get a little bit of information more about Eric Fromm. I knew, I thought he was a psychoanalyst. He was, he was actually a neo-Freudian psychoanalyst, and he was known for his theory of personality based on two primary needs, the need for freedom and the need for belonging. That was interesting. And this is a quote that I first saw the quote, and then I went back and researched him a little bit. His quote was, if I perceive in another person mainly just the surface, I perceive mainly the differences. Differences. If I penetrate to the core, I perceive our identities and the fact of our brotherhood. It's pretty easy on the surface, isn't it, sometimes, to, that, that you, that's what you first notice are those differences. You've got to dig a little bit deeper to appreciate go, you know, beyond that and what, what the brotherhood or the sister, what you have in common. I thought that was insightful. I don't always go along with all that psychoanalytic stuff, but I thought that was a good one. God doesn't want us to be judgmental of others, but desires that will be patient, loving, and tolerant. And I say tolerant carefully because I think that word is, in today's world, is oftentimes being misused and misunderstood. So my second quote that I wanted to share with you 
is a quote from John F. Kennedy about tolerance. Tolerance implies no lack of commitment to one's own belief. Important. Rather, it condemns oppression or persecution of others. Now, it says we're not, not giving on our own beliefs, but at the same time, we're not being oppressive or, or judgmental of people that have different beliefs, right? That, I thought that was a good way of saying it. I'll say it again. Tolerance implies no lack of commitment to one's own beliefs. Rather, it condemns oppression or persecution of others. Now, let's take our story of the Christian church becoming unhindered, the next step, and that's in the church at Antioch. There were some men from Cyprus and Cyrene. Most likely they had been in contact with Paul who came to Antioch and they began sharing the news of, the, of the, Jesus with the Greek Gentiles. Remember before we talked about um, what was happening in Antioch and it was just the message going to the Jews. Now we have these men coming and they are speaking to the Greek Gentiles there. News of that reached that leadership back in Jerusalem and they send Barnabas out again to investigate whether this is genuine again, authentic. And Barnabas does determine that that's the case, that the experience of these Gentiles receiving Jesus is authentic. He, he even went so far as to bring um, Paul in Tarsus there uh, to Antioch. And he was able then to help these new believers no longer be burdened by some of the old Jewish laws and traditions. And we know from our homework that it was here in Antioch that these believers were first called Christians. These events, the, the visions that we talked about of Peter and Cornelius, and now what's happening in Antioch, these are all interesting things that show that advancement of the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. I referred to that in the homework too. The promise that I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of earth will be blessed through you. Right? That was that promise that this message, this gospel message of Jesus Christ was ultimately going to go right to all the peoples in the earth. And you look at what's happened in our lifetimes, right? There's so much more of ability to be able to get that word out with all the technology and everything else too. It's not just the physical missionaries going out anymore, right? <clears throat> all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Now, we also took a look at this, the story that I refer here to Peter's short-lived hypocrisy. And this happened in Antioch, and there was this controversy that arose between Paul and Peter. <clears throat> and we get most of our information about that from Paul's lettering in Galatians 2. Paul, had, Paul noticed that Peter had originally not had any problem associating or eating with the Gentiles there in Antioch. But then some of those leaders from Jerusalem come, and then Paul starts changing his, his behavior. I mean, Peter starts changing his behavior a bit, doesn't he? And he starts separating himself, himself from those others. And it, most likely, he was yielding to the pressure of the people called the Judaizers. They were also known as the Circumcision Party. They were Pharisees who were converted. They were believers, but they were still hanging on to the fact that they still felt circumcision was necessary to be saved. And that was probably the group that was most influencing um, Peter at this point in time. But when it started that not only Peter, but some other Jews started following um, Peter's take on this, that Paul decided, I got to stand up to this. So Paul opposes Peter to his face in Antioch. And he had two really good statements that I pulled out. I think it was really strong truth that needed to be said and heard. The first was um, in Galatians 2.21. 
If righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. That's, that's heavy, isn't it? That's a heavy one. And the other is Galatians 2.16. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. Very good, strong points, right, that Paul makes. Fortunately, the hypocrisy on Peter's part was short-lived. <laughs> he came back around. Good going, Paul, <laughs> and Holy Spirit. And he actually went so far as to um, go back to the Jerusalem council and proclaim before him that, that God had accepted um, believing Gentiles and giving them the Holy Spirit. And who would man to try to now put back on those old Jewish requirements? So he did come back around. It's a good example of why as Christians, sometimes we do need to speak up boldly. Boldly, but in love, right? When there's something that isn't quite right. Because even our precious Peter did it. Now, I included that incident because it does raise important consideration for us. As Christians, how we live in public view matters, doesn't it? <laughs> How we live in public view matters. Circumstances can sometimes create pressure on us to compromise a bit or to maybe put our values on the back burner. Right. Either way, exhibiting that kind of compromise has, can have a negative effect on what people think of us because we don't maybe seem consistent right? Doing what we say we believe. But it's also harmful for the church as a whole, right? So when we do those kinds of things and they view that compromise with us, it, it hurts the Christian church as well. Right? Now, let's move to Peter's arrest and his miraculous escape. This takes place about 14 years after the resurrection of Jesus. So we're at about AD 44, and King Herod is, is ruling there. And he started arresting some of the people who belonged to the Christian church there in Jerusalem. He actually put James, the brother of John, to death by sword. And he seized Peter and put him into prison. The night before Peter's trial was to occur, he's bound there in prison between two, sol two soldiers with these big old chains and he's miraculously um, uh, uh, released by an angel. He goes to the house of Mary, John Mark's mother, where many, it said, had, been, had gathered there to pray. And I, I kind of take it part of it, they may have been praying about, about um, Peter's situation, given that he was, was supposed to be going to trial and such soon. And we... It, we note elsewhere, we was talking about the fact that they didn't all really believe, right? Did this really happen? Is he really there? He was all bound up in prison. How could he be standing here at our door? There was a little bit of doubt there that was creeping through. Peter tells them um, to let all of his brothers know that he's safe. He has escaped, but he has to leave for another place. I'll we'll talk about that further in just a moment. Let him know I'm okay, but I'm not staying here. I have to leave for another place. Before we pick up on that, though, I'd like to address five characteristics of God that I see uh, displayed in this miracle that Peter experienced. And since God is the same yesterday and today and forever, there are characteristics of God that are important to us as well. I think he demonstrates he's a God of deliverance. We oftentimes can be constrained by the circumstances where we don't maybe have the power to control or to escape whatever's going on. But we too can experience right, a deliverance that is mind-boggling, right? That is, that is amazing beyond our ability, beyond our imagination sometimes. 
I think I already shared the example, but I'll mention it briefly again. I couldn't remember for sure about when I went skiing and the semi truck jackknifed. Did I mention that one? That's the one that again came to my mind that there was no escape for Wayne and I. We just sat there in that car with this semi truck heading for us and no place to go. And at just the right time, it straightens out and goes by us. Example, right? Where we, uh, we may not be in control, but we can see those miraculous interventions by a God of deliverance. God is also a God of perfect timing. It was perfect timing in that semi-truck situation too, by the way. But <laughs> God doesn't always come when we want him to, does he? I think a lot of times we want him to get there earlier. <laughs> We're ready for his intervention. I can't do this anymore on my own. But, but he, he, he always knows when is the right time. And he's on time always, even if we don't believe it. Or as the Bible would say, in the fullness of time. right? In the fullness of time, he is there. right? He's also a God of faithfulness. Like those people who had been praying for Peter's release and didn't really, couldn't believe it was him at the door. Our faith also may not always be strong enough to ward off every doubt. Right? Sometimes we too have doubts. But thank goodness, God's faithfulness is not dependent on our faith. God's faith is not dependent on our faith. And he can release prisoners uh, any kind of bondage or danger or whatever, even if we're still filled with some doubt or despair. Sometimes I think despair gets in the way even more than doubt at times, right? When you're feeling it's more hopeless. He is a God of faithfulness. He is also a God of guidance. He guides us. And this is where I want to pick up on the fact that Peter had left for another place. Peter tells again the, at Mary's house that to tell the brothers he was okay, he had escaped, but that he was leaving for another place. And what was happening here is that um, he's leaving there and he's no longer going to be in that, in that New Testament spotlight, in that part of the world. It's not safe for him to stay there. So he and his wife leave and they go to the Mediterranean world of the Roman Empire and they will minister there. He had to leave and go to another place. And again, how God uses those situations, right? To keep sending people out to different places, spreading that word. And the fifth characteristic, excuse me, fifth characteristic of God is that above all, he is a God of love. He's a God of love. That's God's motivation, isn't it? His love for us. And his love just... For all of us, he just carves away at the rock of our being, using our mistakes as well as our victories to teach us spiritual lessons. And those lessons ultimately then create that unique masterpiece that we've talked about that each of us are designed to be, right? That plan he has for us, that vision of what he has for us in this life. So five key characteristics of God that I think were worth mentioning. Now, let's go back to the story. And when Peter left the home of Mary and that danger that was there in Jerusalem, little did he know that he would actually be reunited with um, John Mark about 20 years later. When Paul and Barnabas departed on their first missionary journey, that was about A.D. 47. Barnabas brought his teenage cousin, John Mark, to come and assist them in that missionary journey. But he didn't work out that well. He didn't stay too long. He ends up going back to Jerusalem. And that ended up causing kind of a rift between um, Paul and Peter. So when it came time for the second missionary journey, they, Paul said, there's no way I'm going to do this with John Mark. <laughs> no way. So Paul kind of teams up with Silas at that point in time. But John Mark does come, and he and Barnabas team up, and they head for Cyprus. Now, John Mark, then, we don't hear anything really about him for about another 10 years in terms of what's been preserved for us. But he reemerges 
about AD 60 in Rome. And we have a letter of Paul's and a letter of Peter's that make this apparent. In, in 2 Timothy 4.11, Paul is at that point a prisoner in Rome, and he asks that they bring John Mark to him. So we know he's there and he's asked to see him. In 1 Peter 3.13, he makes reference to John Mark. Again, it seems like strong evidence that he's there in Rome, and he apparently had a working relationship with both Peter and Paul. This is prior to the most severe persecution that broke out in AD 64, the persecution of Nero against the Christians. You'll remember that we noted in lesson one that it was the unanimous testimony of the early church that the Gospel of Mark was written by this John Mark. And the dominant reason for him to write it, right, was to, to preserve the account of Jesus' life and his teachings because they, they're concerned all these eyewitnesses of Jesus are dying. And now there's this likely martyrdom of Peter and Paul too. So there's a need to preserve that word beyond just the eyewitnesses of the time. Now the probable um, martyrdom, right, did end up happening. And we'll, and we'll talk about that in a few moments. The other reason that uh, John Mark wrote this, and one of the advantages that came of it, is that the Christians in that Roman world were really being persecuted against um, heavily. And so it was also a source, those letters and things that were shared and the, the gospel things that he was putting together gave them comfort and assistance in that time of suffering. The Gospel of Mark really paints a human portrait of Peter. The struggling disciple, <laughs> pointing out both his struggles and personal failures, we see that oh, often those are the things that help us to grow strong in our faith and our understanding of who Jesus is and what he did, right? This is what we talked about early in, in lesson one. That's the, right, the, the book of that message. Who is Jesus and what did he do for us? Now let's talk about Peter's final, final years. Nero became the emperor in Rome in AD 54, and he ruled until he died at age 68. That seemed pretty late for that period of time in history. He lived to 68. Under Nero's rule, there was severe persecution of the Christians. And that's the time when Peter and Paul spent time in the maritime prison in Rome. Some years ago, Wayne and I went to Italy, and we actually got to go to that site. Maybe some of you are nodding. And it's quite an interesting feeling to go down in that dungeon, basically, and think that oh, Peter and Paul were in here at some point, you know? And, and it's just it's amazing to think what they did, the strength of their faith to be the witnesses that they, that they were. Paul was um, beheaded, and it's thought that um, he, because he was a Roman citizen, they beheaded him because that was seen as a more merciful kind of death. I guess it's quick. That doesn't feel merciful to me, but it was quick, right? <laughs> Whereas Peter was crucified as the Lord had, had predicted, right? And told Peter, we looked at that before, told Peter that he would be crucified. That would be his end. But Peter then did ask to be hung upside down. Um, I think he wanted that distinction that it wasn't exactly as his, his Lord had been crucified. In 1 Peter 4, verses 12 to 13, Peter expresses how he faced death and how he encouraged others to do as well. You looked at this in your homework. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Pretty, pretty powerful what this Holy Spirit was able to do through him and the kind of suffering that many of those early Christians had. Now, it is thought that Peter was buried in the necropolis that is 
below St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. That was excavated in the 1940s, that late 1940s, when they found that necropolis underneath there. And it's very interesting that um, sometime later, some years later, they found some bones wrapped in purple cloth and placed in a white marble box. And many people believe that, 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 that those are the bones of Peter. And the interesting thing, real interesting thing that got me was that the archaeologists at the time noted that the very center of the dome of the basilica was right over where they found those bones. And so there are people who say, literally, it seems the church was built on Peter the Rock. <laughs> Now, last week, we talked about 3D, 3D discipleship, some of those demonstrations of what true discipleship looks like. I want to advance that discussion a bit further today and talk about the evidence of effective discipleship from our lesson. The first thing is never ponder whether or not you are of use. Let's face it, we, the Bible in 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, you are not your own, you are bought with a price. And we've talked a lot in our lesson about God having a unique plan for each one of us, right? We should never ponder whether we will be of use. We might have questions sometimes about how we're going to be used, but for us to be open, right, to, to accept the call on our life, never hesitate that you are, are of use or not. Second, if we're going to have effective discipleship, we need to live a life that's worthy of that calling. And it's described in Ephesians 4, 1 to 2. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Not always easy. We're still sinful human beings, can't do it perfectly. But that's the kind of thing that we should be looking at if we're going to be effective disciples. Third thing is realize that as a disciple, it is the Lord's honor that's at stake, not our own. And we mentioned this once before, but I found a really interesting point that I'd never learned before. Aaron the priest, way back in the Jewish history, right? Aaron the priest had a son. And recorded in Numbers 25, 11, the Lord said of that son's service, he was as zealous as I am for my honor among them. He was as zealous as I am for my honor among them. Why? He said, wouldn't you just love for the, go the Lord to think that of us and say, boy, she was as zealous. <laughs> she was as zealous as I am for my honor. I, I would love for the Lord to put that on our tombstone. <laughs> Fourth thing, ask yourself, am I doing everything I can to enable God to bring his redemption into evident reality in other people? Am I doing everything I can to enable God to bring his redemp redemption into evident reality in the lives of others? Now, if you're, I think we all need that encouragement, right? We're probably not uh, any of us doing everything, right? But let me encourage you with these words in 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that we need, right? You'll, be, you'll abound in every good work. We shouldn't hesitate because we know we will be equipped. He will give us everything we need. It is about what God will do in and through us, isn't it? When we yield to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. All we're required to do is to Accept that call, step out in faith, 
And then let's watch the Holy Spirit do his work, right? To be faithful in that. Fifth point, fifth and final point, and then we'll close. Remember what your goal is, is as a disciple. It's recorded for us in Acts 20, 24. Our goal is that we may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. We all have different ways, different characters, different experiences and opportunities, but we're all called, right, to be his spiritual messengers to others. And then we've got the great benefits. Then what we will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And in 2 Timothy 4, 7, there will be in store for us the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to you on that day, on that day. So then I sat back, I go, oh my gosh, can you imagine what that day will be like when we stand before the throne of God? I'm getting chills before the throne of God with all the believers through all time. Peter's gonna be there. <laughs> I can't wait to meet Peter. <laughs> what an awesome thought, right? We are faithful, that's what we have to look forward. Life eternal with God, with all of those other witnesses before the throne. Glory be to God. So let's close with prayer, ladies. If so, if you have handy your teaching guide, I have this prayer printed on that. And I'd like you to pray this with me. Lord, we thank you for Peter's story. We know that we fail you at times. And we thank you for always taking us back. As Peter's life showed us, you are the God of second chances. But Lord, we sincerely pray that through the work of the Holy Spirit, we will exhibit empowered lives, willingly and lovingly applying what we have learned it takes to be fishers of people. Bless us, we pray, with a miraculous catch for your kingdom to come. We pray this in the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.